Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Real Wassa's Real Estate Podcast show. My name is Cody Holscher. I'm a team member here at the Solomon Group at Coldwell Banker Action. And today's topic is going to be a fun one. Um, today, we're going to be talking about what you should do and what you can do to buy your first investment property before the age of 21. So we get this question a lot from people who are maybe in high school or just graduated. Maybe they're going to to school, college, whatever the case may be. And they're wondering if there is a way for them to purchase a property, whether it be a first single family home, maybe a starter home or a duplex investment property. Is there a way you can do it before the age of 21? Because the common consensus that we hear out there is that people think it's really hard. They've been told a lot of things by parents, relatives, um, people they work with, whatever the case is. But absolutely 100% yes, it is possible to buy an investment property or your first single family home by the time that you turn 21. And how do we know that? Because we've helped people do it before, and actually a decent number of people do it before, and it's not as hard as you think it is. So let's start out talking about some of the misconceptions that go around about buying your first home, maybe your first investment property, etc. So you might hear some people say that you're going to need a minimum of one to two years of work at the same employer before they'll even consider you for a loan. And that's definitely not true. Um, You can actually be working at a place for typically a few months, and that work history will be good enough to allow the lender to qualify you for a purchase. Now, what is true is that you're going to have to have some prior work history before that. Um, You're probably going to need one to two years of of some type of job before we have one to two years of tax returns that you can show the lender. Um, But you don't need to be at the same job for like two consecutive years working there um, in order to get pre-qualified. So maybe you're 16, maybe you're 17, and you're working at your high school job part-time, you're saving up some money on the side, you turn 18, you're going to school, you're working full-time, or maybe you're just working full-time, right out of high school, Um, you can switch jobs and you can be at that new job for a few months and actually get qualified for your purchase. So you don't have to be at an employer for a crazy long amount of time before you have the capability to do that, but you do have to have a decent amount of of previous work history and, and tax returns, and that can be before you turn the age of 18. Secondly, The other misconception you're going to hear a lot, especially from the older generation, is that you need 20% down. And maybe that's because this was the case many years ago, but today that's not the case anymore. How much money that you need down is going to depend on what type of loan program you are in. If you're doing a conventional mortgage, which is the most common type of mortgage that we deal with, it's going to require only 3% down. And so if you're buying a really affordable starter home, maybe one that needs some work, that's $100,000, that would only mean that you're putting $3,000 down. That is money that you can realistically save up in a few months worth of time pretty easily. Now, there's some other loan programs out there too, like FHA that are going to require 3.5% down, so just a little bit more. But if your credit score isn't quite as high, you'll still qualify for that type of loan program. There's also um, WIDA loans, which is um, a Wisconsin state program. Some of those loans actually require a 0% down payment, or they will help you with your down payment in the form of a secondary loan that you take out at closing. And so there are options if you have the income coming in, but you don't have a super high down payment, maybe you don't have that 3% saved up, you still have some options. So that's the second common misconception. You do not need 20% down. In fact, a majority of the time, I would say probably 85, 90% of the time, the people that we deal with don't have 20% down. It's definitely more common than not to have less than that. 
And the third misconception is that you need to be making a ton of money and just raking in the dough before you can even think about buying a house. The reality of it is, is you definitely don't. Um, there are houses out there that you can get and have a very affordable mortgage payment. And your lender is going to pre-approve you based off of your income. And so you might not be making a ton of money right out of high school in years 18, 19, 20, and 21, but that's okay. You can still get a house. Now, realistically, if you're looking at the price range of like 70, 80, 90, 100,000, et cetera, maybe up to 130, you probably need to understand that a lot of these houses are going to need some work and they're going to require some upfront investment whether that be painting or flooring or maybe a bathroom rental or maybe a little bit more than that, they're going to require some work. And the lower you go down in price, typically the more work they're going to require. But the thing is, is that that's okay because if you're buying a house at age 18, fresh out of high school, and you put work into that house, you have something called equity. And so five years down the line, maybe you're married, maybe you have dual income now, you're looking to get into something nicer you're going to sell that house and you're going to make a significant amount of money on it because of those renovations and because of the money that you stuck into it. So those are going to be three of the common misconceptions that we deal with. And now moving on to the second thing, which is going to be talking about purchasing what you're going to need to purchase the single family home or the starter investment property, like the duplex, for example. So starting with the duplex, because a lot of young people are really interested in the duplexes because they can rent out one side and live in the other, make some of their money back. So the great thing is, is that if you're buying a duplex and you're going to live in it, you're going to qualify for a primary home loan. And what that means is that the bank recognizes that you're going to be living there. It's going to be your resident. When it comes to investment properties specifically, Lenders are going to require a 20 to 25% down payment, unlike a normal single family house where it can be as little as 3%, 0%, whatever the case is. But because you are living there, they actually forego requiring the 20, 25% down payment and will allow you to put as little as 3% down on a conventional, maybe it's 0% on a WIDA. Whatever the case is, you can put a normal small amount down. And so let's say that you're looking at a older, upper, lower level duplex that needs a little bit of work, but you can get it for $150,000. And that is a scenario. We do see those pop up quite often throughout the year at an affordable price point. That would mean that you'd only need a down payment of $4,500. And then your closing costs might be roughly around the same, maybe a bit more or less, depending on what your loan program is. But it's safe to say that you could have about nine, ten, maybe eleven thousand saved up, and you could purchase that duplex. And so if you're working throughout the years of high school and you're saving up a few thousand dollars a year, it is totally viable, but by, by the time that you graduate high school, that you could have enough money saved up for the down payment and the closing costs to purchase an upper lower level duplex like we just talked about. Now, on the flip side of that, if you're looking at a single family house, um, the equation's pretty much gonna be the same. Most single family homes are done through a conventional loan, which is a 3% down payment. And so if you're buying a $150,000 home, that would be 4,500. Obviously the cheaper you go, the less of a down payment it's going to need, but the more work it's going to need. Uh, but it's the same thing. You could put as little as 0% down with a WIDA type loan if you have the capability of doing so. But if you save up a few thousand every year, you're going to be put in a position where by the age of 18, 19, you could absolutely be ready to purchase your first home. The one thing that I would recommend and I learned this from personal experience, is to have a few extra thousands saved up on top of the down payment and the closing costs. Uh, my wife and I bought our home in 2023, and we did put a substantial amount of money into it to fix things up. And 
I can just tell you from personal experience that things added up cost-wise a lot quicker than we thought that it was going to. And especially if you're looking at your first property and you want it to be something affordable, whether it's that duplex or that single family home, if it's going to be 80,000, 90, 120, it's going to need some work. And so if you save up that 3%, let's say you save up 3% for the down payment and 3% for the closing costs, you have $8,000 in your savings. It's not a bad idea to save up a few thousand on top of that because there's going to be things you want to do, whether it's flooring or paint or you know, replacing some fixtures, whatever the case is, you're going to have some money that you probably want to invest up front. And so if you do that ahead of time, it's going to make things less stressful for when you actually move in. Lastly, what can you do as a buyer outside of saving up that money for the down payment and the closing costs? What can you do to make sure that when you go to apply for a mortgage, you want to get that pre-approval letter that you're going to be able to do so? Well, outside of your income and outside of how much money that you have saved up, an employer is going to take a look at your credit history. And that's going to be a big driving factor for what type of program that you can qualify for. If you have poorer credit, you say you're in the 600s, an FHA loan is probably going to be the only type of loan that you can get. And those are going to require typically 3.5% down and FHA loans can be a little bit more difficult to work with in terms of the buying process. There's just some things that FHA loans uh, don't like, like chipping and peeling paint, missing handrails, stuff like that, that when you're writing an offer uh, can be a little bit of a deterrent to the seller. Now, to qualify for a conventional loan, you'll need a 720 or better credit score. And I could be off on that by a few points, but I know it's in the ballpark of that. Now, how you're going to qualify for a good loan by getting that good credit score is through building up that credit history. So you need to understand credit, how it works, how it impacts you in your financial history, and, and how it affects the purchasing process. The best way to do that is just to do some hands-on research. Go out there and look up online, read some articles, um, look it up on YouTube, Talk to qualified people, whether it be a financial advisor or maybe somebody who's in banking or a mortgage lender, and they can kind of tell you like what the effects of credit will be and how it will affect things on the buying process, right? Uh, in short, the higher credit score you get, the better typically interest rate you're going to get, um, the better loan program you're going to qualify for, and the easier the pre-approval process is going to be. So... Secondly, the thing that I would recommend is that you need to get a credit card with a small, uh, manageable, available balance on it. This might be like a local credit card from a local credit union that has a $500, maybe $1,000 limit on it, and you use that credit card just for things like gas, food, maybe a small shopping spree here or there, but, but never really keep your utilization on it super high. So if you have a $500 limit, I would try to stick around no more than like having 100 to $150 on it and then make sure you pay that off in full every single month. What that will do is that will slowly drive your credit up, up, and up. And if you do that and you start that in high school or even your early adulthood, um, it's totally realistic that by the time that you are you know, in your 20s, that your credit score should be well into the 700s. Uh, the other thing that you can do is that if you can't get a credit card because you're too young, um, you can actually become a user on your parents' card. Obviously, they have to approve that. Uh, but if you become a user on their card and right, maybe you spend some money, you pay them back, it should help drive your credit score up and give you some credit history. And the last thing I'm going to say, the biggest tip outside of credit card is going to be to work hard and save, save, save. Um, a lot of people have this idea that this dream of ownership is unobtainable for young people. And while it may be hard to go to school and work a lot and save up, if you do that and you make some sacrifices in your high school years and your early adult years, and you actually buy that investment property, you buy that single family home by the age of 21 or before, you're going to be in a small percentage of people who have achieved that 
which is, is really, really cool when you think about it. And not only is it cool, but it sets you up for success later on. Because if you get married down the line or you graduate from school, you get that promotion at work, you're making more money, you're going to sell that house and you're going to make money off of it. Or you're going to move out of that investment property and then that investment property um, is going to be rented out on both the upper and the lower level and you're going to be making twice as much on it and be able to use that income to factor in your next home purchase. So that's going to wrap up today's episode of the Real Wasis Real Estate Podcast. Kind of a long episode, but really interesting. We want to thank you all for listening. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to PM us. Um, We'd love to answer your real estate questions. And we hope that you guys will tune in to next week's episode of The Real.